Hello, and welcome to Beyond Diversity and Fostering Inclusion and Belonging at CCL. Uh, I'm Tony Serna, and I want to welcome everyone uh, for the next 90 minutes. Oops. For the next 90 minutes, we'll be hearing from Clara Fang and uh, Karina Ramirez. Clara Fang is our CCL Student Engagement Coordinator at uh, CCL and Karina is our diversity outreach manager. We'll be taking questions via the chat. Thank you. And now on to Clara. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Karina and I are honored and humbled to be sharing with you our knowledge about diversity, equity, inclusion, and how it intersects with CCL. Um, I just want to acknowledge that it's been a really difficult two weeks, two months, a whole year for all of us. Um, and uh, this has really affected all of our work. Um, but CCL is a community and we support each other. Uh, and we know that racism really affects every aspect of our society and everything that we do. So we cannot fight climate justice without also fighting for racial justice. So we are really committed to this work and uh, Hope to be sharing some of that with you today. So on June 1st, um, our executive director, Mark Reynolds, released this following statement. It is not enough simply to list diversity as one of our values. The best way we can proclaim that Black Lives Matter to CCL and that we care deeply about your well-being and your safety and your happiness is for us to take concrete action. So we're taking this moment to educate the predominantly white members of our organization about recent events and what they can do to help. We are making plans to offer additional training to our volunteers on racism, privilege, bias, diversity in the environmental movement, and more, including in a special seminar at our upcoming virtual conference. We will continue to look for ways to do more and to do better. Like climate change, there is no simple fix for racism, but we will not shy away from doing our part in this vital work. So you can read the uh, full statement at um, the link that's included on this slide. So um, I also wanna say a little bit about how um, in this presentation, we are giving an introduction to this topic. There is way too much that we can't cover in an hour and a half, but we hope to provide some resources for you to explore and to also um, invite you to join us for future webinars, discussions and events to learn and take action together. So before we continue further, um, we wanted to talk a bit about what we're seeing around us. As Clara mentioned, it's been a very, very difficult uh, couple of weeks. And in my line of work, um, everything sort of just intersected. So when I saw this article, like many of us have seen, if you went to diversity uh, track yesterday, um, we shared a little bit about it also in one during the session. But Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson is a marine biologist. And I think the reason why we are sharing this um, a lot is because it really does, um, she expressed what a lot of us wanted to say. Um, this is a portion of what she mentioned in that article. Look, I would love to ignore racism and focus all my attention on climate, but I can't because I'm human and I'm black and ignoring racism won't make it go away. So to white people who care about maintaining a habitable planet, I need you to become actively anti-racist. I need you to understand that our racial inequity crisis is intertwined with our climate crisis. If we don't work on both, we will succeed at neither. I need you to step up, please, because I'm exhausted. Another thing I wanted to share with you, um, it's just a situation that we're seeing um, throughout our lives. Um, you spend a couple of days concerned about what you're seeing. Um, maybe you fought with your family about what is happening around us. I know I have. <laughs> um, and it has been a lot of education since the beginning of the civil unrest that you're seeing. And it made me think a lot about just what people are living. So I wanted to share this video with you because Amber Ruffin um, explains it on what it's like for her to be a Black person in this country.
I wanted to say, well, um, Clara puts out her slides. Uh, Amber spent the rest of that week sharing stories of things that happened to her. Uh, she is, by nature, a great comedian. If you haven't seen her sessions on, um, on what she does during uh, that um, late night show, it, it definitely show a different side of her. And people had to have been grateful that we get to hear the stories. Um, as she said, you know, something that a lot of the community doesn't share. So now going back to why you're here and continuing on with our presentation. So three things that we're going to cover. Um, we're gonna talk about why diversity and why that's important to PPL. Um, when it look at privilege and racism, um, we're gonna give you suggestions on what you can do and share resources. All right, so why is diversity important for the climate movement? So first of all, we know that African-Americans and people of color are disproportionately affected by climate impacts. Uh, they are also usually the hardest hit by climate disasters. For example, African-Americans constitute 13% of the U.S. population. They contribute 23% less to climate change, but bear 21% more of the harms when compared to other racial groups. 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant compared to 56% of whites. African Americans are twice as likely to die from dangerous heat compared to other groups. And Latino Americans are three times more likely to die from asthma than other racial or ethnic groups in the United States. People of color are a growing segment of the population and they are increasingly determining the outcomes of elections. So we know that by 2045, people of color will become more than 50% of the U.S. population. They are currently 40% of the U.S. population. So if a movement is not representing them, then we're not going to be seen as taking into account the needs of the majority of the country. Through many surveys and studies, uh, we have found that people of color support climate action more than whites. Hispanic and Latino and Black Americans are more likely to be alarmed or concerned about global warming than whites, according to the study from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Hispanic, Latino, and Black Americans are also more willing than whites to join a campaign to convince elected officials to take action to reduce global warming. Diversity and equity and inclusion also creates competitive advantage for environmental organizations. These benefits include an empowering work culture, being known as a fair and equitable employer, more grants, donations, and contributions, more creativity, innovation, and better problem solving, attracting volunteers from a broader base and vol volunteer membership, better relationships with partners and communities of color, and more opportunities for learning and growth with a diversity of backgrounds, perspectives, and approaches. And we know that nature thrives on diversity. Um, when we look at ecosystems out there, uh, we need to see that diversity creates resilience and beauty for natural ecosystems. So at this point, we'd like to launch a poll. Thank you very much. Um, so um, please answer on the screen for us, how racially diverse is your CCL chapter? Um, very diverse, 60% or more people of color, somewhat diverse, 31 to 59%. Not very diverse, 11 to 30%, not diverse at all, does not apply to me. And how racially diverse is your community? You know, we have like 300 people on this call, so lots of answers coming in. All right, that's good. If I press end polling, okay, here we go, share results. Um, yeah, so we can see that uh, among at least this group, um, people are saying, um, the most common response for how racially diverse is your community is that it's somewhat diverse or not very diverse. Um, but for CCL chapters, it's overwhelmingly not diverse at all. <laughs> so this isn't surprising really in, in most environmental organizations, racial diversity is much less than the general population. So if people of color are 40% of the US population and they care more about climate change than whites, why is it that they are not filling the ranks of the climate movement? Well, there are a lot of barriers of history and culture um, that have been intentionally in place for a very long time. 
So I'm going to illustrate this by sharing with you my personal story uh, of being involved in um, the environmental movement. So um, I grew up in Shanghai and Washington, D.C. My family immigrated to the U.S. when I was nine years old. My parents both had higher education at a time in China when not a lot of people did. I was an only child, so I was pretty spoiled, as you can imagine. My family had uh, a strong conservation ethic. If you know anything about Asians, they, they hate leaving on the lights. They never throw out anything. They're big conservers. I had outdoor experiences when I was growing up. I went on camping and hiking trips with my classmates. I graduated from Smith and Yale. And I, I benefited from Asian positive bias. You know, when, when I did well academically, no teacher was wondering if I cheated on the test. Um, uh, everybody thinks that you're smart and well-behaved when you're a young Asian American. But I also had some barriers. Um, this is a picture of me with my father. So um, I was born in 1983. And um, the, in the years before that, um, my parents lived through the Chinese Cultural Revolution. And my father was a political prisoner under the uh, Communist Party for 20 years because of something he said in his youth that was um, uh, not favored by the government. So, you know, we, we have um, a lot of political trauma and um, it's, it's a sensitive thing to speak out against the government. I mean, in, in the case of uh, um, our culture, it could cost you your life. Um, I also um, spent my early childhood in Shanghai in the 1980s when it was very much still a developing country. And um, every family cooked with coal stoves in their backyard. I never saw a blue sky until I moved to the United States. Um, everybody went around coughing, spitting with asthma. And like, I just thought that was totally normal. Um, then when I came here, I was just so amazed by the clean air and um, you know, nature around us. Um, it instilled in me a great appreciation for clean air and water. Um, but I also dealt with the hardships of immigration and, um, uh, you know, reestablishing ourselves in a, a new country, being a minority, um, and this millennial economic reality where we ended up with a lot of student loans and not a great job market. So, you know, we, uh, I think we've all heard of something called white privilege. Um, but I'd also like us to consider something called environmental privilege. What are the privileges that enable us to participate in environmental activism? So as I list off these items, I'd like for you to count to yourselves how many of these you said yes to. I grew up in a town with clean air. My family owned our home. My home had a backyard. My parents were health conscious and provided a healthy diet. I lived in proximity to parks, gardens, and green spaces. I went on camping trips and nature excursions as a child or young adult. My family was environmentally conscious. I had environmental education in school. My parents were politically active. I or my family volunteered for environmental or charity organizations. Okay, so I'm gonna do the poll. Perfect. How many of these environmental privileges did you have? Lots of answers coming in. Uh, nobody said zero or one so far. Lots of people had five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. Wow, so it's like over 80% of us had um, more than half of these items. So we're a pretty privileged group. Um, and you can imagine not having these privileges would prevent, present barriers to being a part of the environmental movement. Okay. I, I, Hope that this works for us, but um, my vision here is that you will be able to share with us in the chat what environmental privileges that you grew up, um, like in a, a sentence or whatever you want to say. Grew up on a farm, summer vacations, education, my family vacations to beautiful places, usually live near the ocean, summer camp nearby beaches and nature, parents with a strong conservation ethic, uh, wealthiest section, trips to national parks, overnight camp in beautiful nature area for eight weeks every year, 
my mother planted a vegetable garden, bought me glass in high school, summer trips. My mom was a great example and saved, reused, and recycled. Community garden, scouting, nutrition education in school and healthy food at home, camping, good education, hiking, fishing with parents. Grew up in a low population and rural, rural area. All right, that's good, Susan. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I actually remember my friends growing up telling me about these things, like going on ha camping trips or trips to national parks. And it just seems like such a um, standard part of um, American, American childhoods. Um, but it wasn't for me. You know, like my family didn't do that in the summers. And for a lot of people, that wasn't really a part of their life. So if we think about... Um, uh, why a lot of people wouldn't have access to these things. Um, we actually have to go back to the early 1800s and the beginning of the U.S. conservation movement, where um, people of color were intentionally kept out of nature and the environmental movement. So early organiz environmental organizations in the 1800s, like the Boone and Crockett Club, the Sierra Club, and the Audubon Society, were pretty much social clubs for wealthy people that enjoyed the outdoors. Um, conservation founders like Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and John Muir were elite wealthy white men who wanted to preserve their hunting, fishing, and hiking grounds. So those early environmental organizations were beneficiaries of capitalism, institutional racism, and patriarchy. They intentionally excluded membership from women, people of color, and poor people. They were uninterested in addressing social inequalities like slavery, the oppression of women, and the abuse of labor. These were issues that progressives at the time were very active in, but environmentalists felt like, you know, we just want to preserve nature and allow wealthy people a nice playground. Um, and nature was a place to escape from these struggles in the city. So their agendas were harmful to Native Americans and people of color. They took land from Native American tribes to make room for new national parks and monuments, willfully annexed land, land from Latinos and incited violence on those that resisted, and dispossessed land promised to newly emancipated black citizens after the Civil War. Plus many other things. So you can imagine after uh, hundreds of years of colonialism and racism and, in, and uh, literally kicking people out of nature and environmental organizations. People of color don't feel safe in environmental organizations, and um, they are reluctant to call themselves environmentalists. So in this chart, we see that in the last 10 years, um, the uh, population of people of color in the, the general population has increased from 35 to 40 percent, but the um, um, percentage of people of color in environmental organizations um, was only about 12% to now like 18%. And in, in the last 10 years, environmental organizations were, were, are, have been much better about um, acknowledging that past and trying to be more inclusive, um, but uh, it's really not made a huge difference. Um, and the increases are just really parallel with the increases in POC in the general population. So um, this is a study from Green 2.0, which um, surveyed the top 40 environmental organizations in the last three years. Um, and in their data, uh, they, they looked at women and people of color in the top 40 environmental organizations, percentage of full-time employees. Um, in 2019, this was about 30% for people of color. Uh, senior staff was less, only about 20%. All right, so, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, that's all very unfortunate, but it's historical, right? Um, but racism still pervades every aspect of our society. So next I'm going to explain some of the way, ways in which racism shows up. So there's mainly four kinds of racism um, that we, we encounter. There's uh, personal, um, private beliefs, prejudices, and ideas that individuals have. 
So, you know, like what, what you're thinking to yourself when a black person walks by or it, people of color, you know, often feel um, inferior themselves you know, that have that internalized sense of racism. There's interpersonal, so expressions of racism between individuals. Um, and we, what we often are talking about when we address um, like corporate culture, you know, having people get along better, not be offensive to each other. A lot of that is aimed at the interpersonal level of racism. But then there's, there's also institutional racism, which refers to discriminatory treatment, policies and practices within organizations and institutions. So that might look like um, a discriminatory hiring process or um, uh, discrimination when it comes to housing or finance or our criminal justice system. Then there's structural racism, which is systems in which public policies, institutional practices, and other norms perpetuate racial group inequality. So we see that in, in our education system, in, in health, in uh, media, in the culture, all these ways in which blacks and people of color are um, oppressed and kept from advancing in society. So here's another way of um, looking at it where we have overt white supremacy, generally considered socially unacceptable at the top of this pyramid. So things like lynching, hate crimes, blackface, the N-word, swastikas, uh, KKK, like things that we consider are really pretty nasty and um, uh, overt kind of racism. But there's also a lot of covert white supremacy, um, which we don't call out that much. So things like calling the police on black people, or white silence, um, Eurocentric curriculum, white savior complex, spiritual bypassing, discriminatory lending, mass incarceration, I mean, on and on, BIPOC is Halloween costumes. I mean, tons of examples where um, we're acting out uh, biases and, and different kinds of racism. We could spend an hour on this, but unfortunately we can't. <laughs> All right. so. Racism happens in different kinds of intensity, right? Not all of it is equal. So uh, most egregiously, uh, physical attacks, vandalism, boycotts, denying space, um, really violent forms of racism. Um, but there are also micro assaults, uh, things like racial slurs, um, displaying swastikas or deliver deliberately serving a white person before a person of color in a restaurant. And then there are microaggressions a subtle but offensive comment or action directed at a person of color or other non-dominant group that is often unintentional but unconsciously reinforces the stereotype. So I want to emphasize that microaggressions are often unintentional and unconscious. So somebody may be saying, it, saying something as a compliment or um, just as a general remark and they don't think that it's racist at all, it was not intended that way, but it it reinforces a stereotype and is offensive. So I'm going to share some examples of these. So, you know, we've, we've had these very unfortunate and highly visible incidences of assault on um, people of color recently, uh, George Floyd, uh, and then also with um, Amy Cooper in, in Central Park, uh, where she called the police because she felt threatened by the presence of a black man. Coronavirus has brought out a lot of racism against Asians, from uh, physical assault to um, verbally insulting Asian Americans to uh, doing microaggressive stuff like, um, you know, avoiding them in the supermarket line or, um, you know, giving people dirty looks or moving away from them, things like that. Um, in the climate movement, we have this example from last year where uh, these young climate activists were uh, brought to a news conference in Davos, and then um, um, Nakate, who is a young black climate activist from Uganda, was cropped out of the picture and left out of the news that was written up about um, the youth participation in, in this event. I was not on the list of participants, she said. None of my comments from the press conference were included, and it was like I wasn't even there. So after she tweeted about this, there was a ton of backlash and people were all calling out how racist this was. Um, and uh, the, the news reprinted the article with her picture. 
So here are also some forms of um, microaggression. Um, you're really pretty for a dark-skinned girl. You don't act like a normal black person, you know? So these are examples of, of um, actual things that were said to these people holding the sign. The photographer was doing this project and he asked them to, to write down the examples of microaggressions and, and he took photos of them. So here are two Latinos. So like, what are you? You don't speak Spanish? What might be wrong with these statements? I get this one a lot. Your English is so good. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I actually did my master's in English um, in, uh, in the United States. African-Americans get this. Wow, you're so articulate. All right. So I think I threw a lot of information at you um, in that bit. Um, so I'd like to take a moment and um, ask you, what are you thinking and feeling at this point? Um, what questions can we help you address? So we have some uh, questions that have come in, but if anybody has questions or things they'd like to share, you can keep sending them to ask me questions. Um, we have a question. Has or is CCL working to find ways to get climate change and climate justice resources to areas with large numbers of people of color who don't have access to resources such as the internet, libraries, and climate education in schools? Yeah, I, I think we have been doing that. And uh, Karina's section will talk a lot more about it. So I'll let her do that later. Um, we have another question. Could you clarify how not having environmental privileges is a barrier to being involved in climate organizations? Um, so, so you'd like me to say more about that? Well, um, <laughs> you, can, you can imagine, um, um, you know, people who end up caring about nature are often those who have had positive experiences in nature. And um, going on trips and, and visiting national parks and, and having positive experiences when it comes to those things foster environmental behaviors and joining environmental organizations. And for people of color, um, they've, they've had to deal with things like um, park rangers coming up to them and questioning them like, like why are you here when they are just visiting a park? Or, or like camping and, and people coming up to them and being like, like, why are you here? Like, you are loitering or bothering us. Um, so, and you know, like historically, um, nature has been a scary place for a lot of African Americans, you know, where uh, uh, violence and rape happened in nature, or, you know, they were trying to escape slavery. Um, so there's a lot of trauma that's associated with, with nature for a lot of people of color. Um, other barriers like you know, like, like volunteering for CCL requires a lot of privilege. You have to have time. You need to attend meetings at all times of the day. You need to put up your own money to go to events or buy signs or whatever it is. Um, and, and who has that privilege? You know, um, if, if you have to work and have children, like you may not be able to participate so much in climate activism. May yeah. I add a little bit to, to your answer, Clara, from my experience? <laughs> When you put the poll, I couldn't answer because we are doing the, the back end of the presentation. But um, in that list, I barely had two, two privileges. Um, I have yet gone camping. I am 45. <laughs> I haven't gone camping yet. Uh, being the outdoors was not really a conversation that we had with my parents. They work all the time. Even when I wanted to participate in something like Girl Scouts, they were like, I can't take you. There is nothing in my schedule that will allow me to ever participate. So I didn't get to really try to enjoy as much as the outdoors of other people um, until much later up in life. Like I started taking up walk and then just, you know, being with nature in, in, that, in that way. So yeah, not a lot of people can. Even when I first tried to go to my first CCL meeting, I had a fundraising order to take myself there. Um, and, and I got lucky during that time because I was going to a career transition, so I had time. But I'm sure if I would have been fully employed, I would not have been able to go and attend anything in DC. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I, I could also share that, that um, doing uh, environmental work as a profession was really uh, susceptible to, to my parents or 
it's that maybe that's not the right word, but they were skeptical of that. They were like, like, well, you know, it's it's so much better if you can be a doctor or a lawyer or something a little more stable. <laughs> but like, what is this that you're trying to do? Like, like, it's just, yeah, um, not very common for immigrants. Um, any other good questions? Um, we have a quick one. Um, do you know of any non-white organizations or groups that might want a speaker from CCL? That might want a speaker from CCL? Well, we would certainly like for them to speak to us, I think. <laughs> um, um, if they would like to speak to us, that would be great. But uh, we're also conscious that we don't want to, um, you know, impose what we want to do on them. That, like, in supporting people of color and, and their activists in the environment, we really need to be welcoming and to listen to their concerns and um, do a lot more listening because that hasn't happened very much in the environmental movement. All right, let's keep going. So Karina is gonna talk to you now about diversity at CCL, where we're now and what can we do? All right, thank you. I finally got an opportunity to do what I wanted to do yesterday during the diversity track and couldn't because we were so short on time. Um, so if you go to a lot of diversity spaces, you would hear land acknowledgement. It's just something that I wanted to do here for us for CCL. I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the traditional land of the Seminole, Giaga, and Tequesta peoples, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through the generations. This calls us to commit to continue to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. So as Clara shared her story, let me tell you about me. Um, that was me with long hair, <laughs> uh, for one. Um, when I present myself, I usually say I am Ecuadorian, although I've lived my entire life since I was nine in the United States. I am a mother to a college student who's studying global environmental science. I used to be a journalist. Um, that photo in black and white was when I was in Philadelphia covering uh, the Pope's visit. I was able to travel from Dallas, where I lived at the time, to cover the Pope. Um, interesting experience, trying to do reporting uh, from the floor, but it was done. And when I am not working or volunteering, I spent my time writing postcards and getting postcards from friends. I've been collecting postcards since I was 14 years old. Um, it's my way to travel. Like, you know, it talks about, we're talking about the privileges that people have. I've always wanted to travel. It hasn't been something that I've been able to do because of financial constraints, life in general. So that's the way I continue to learn about the world around me. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna share this stat. So I'm sure you wanna know how are we doing with racial diversity at CCL. Um, this is information from May, 2019 to April, 2020. Right now, our organization is about 83% white and 17% people of color. When we started tracking in 2013, we were at 94% white and 6% people of color. Uh, when people joined the organization um, a couple of months in, and Tony, you can correct me at any point, uh, people voluntarily take a demographic survey. Um, it is my hope that maybe we can do something so that demographic survey can be taken um, the minute they join CCL so that we can continue to have more um, demographics in this. So last year, as we started looking into um, what we wanted to do, as an organization, one of the things that were pointed out, I'm like, you know, it would be great to have a diversity value. So last year, in addition to focus, optimism, relationships, integrity, personal power, and being nonpartisan, um, a couple of us, uh, we created a committee and we wrote this diversity value. Right now, this value does not have socioeconomic factors, although early on this year, it was approved. It was actually something that one of our CCLs had brought up when we first presented it last fall. But this is a part of our commitment to begin addressing diversity concerns to our organization um, in the hope to create the environment we wish to see. So national diversity at CCL, which falls um, in what I do now, my job, um, is try to see where we are and what we can do. So in phase one, we spent a couple of years, um, last year, we had actually an in-depth study of the organization. It was being done prior to me joining, so I joined in 2017. Last year, we wrote a strategic plan 
Um, we have been providing as an organization more scholarships to young people, people of color, so that they can attend our conferences as well as be participants in our fellowships. Um, what is next after this conference? Um, as my work has continued to increase, we're gonna continue having discussions about all of these topics, racism, privilege, bias, diversity. Um, my goal is to have diversity included in all areas of our organization. Um, we want to normalize this, and we're going to continue to evaluate what we do. As a CCL volunteer, just diversity work, if you're willing to commit to it, um, it's going to require you to think and work outside of your comfort zone, I invite you to listen and learn, and want you to consider that everything is interconnected. Audre Lorde, an American writer, feminist, uh, librarian, and civil rights activist would say, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Also another thing that we have going for CCL, um, in typical CCL fashion, we come and we create what we don't see, right? So when I joined in 2017, my goal at the time was to have a Spanish language website because coming from the journalism background, one of the things that I would get often is um, we wanna tell people about what we're doing. And I would say, yeah, wonderful, great. But you have a website where I can point them to, to your work. And I came to find that CCL didn't have one, or it did have one, but it was in Panama for the volunteers that were working at CCL at that time. So a couple of us created climavivible.org. That is the website in Spanish. And back then it was known as the Spanish Language Action Team. And while we were um, evaluating the work, we're like, well, you know, Latinos also come in different shades uh, sizes and forms and languages. And I'm like, oh, I'm forgetting about the English speaking Latinos. So we just decided to call the team Latinos. So that was uh, 2017 when we started. We changed it a bit in 2019. And then we have all these wonderful affinity groups in front of you. Climate and Culture started last year, as well as the People of the Global Majority, which is a support group for people of color only. Um, we also started LGBTQA which actually started in 2019, but it got reworked. And the new team is being led by Stacey McReynolds, Brielle Sinton, and Melissa Kioski. So it's new. I ask you to please uh, go and support them. And I am definitely excited about the new Asian Pacific Action Team. Um, both of these teams uh, just started, restarted uh, maybe in the last month and a half. So it's extremely new. Uh, there in the pictures, you see uh, Nancy Dong and Nadine Wang, who are two of four core leaders of that team. And that team is going to have their first meeting on June 25th. You're welcome to email uh, Diversity at Citizens Climate if you want to learn more about them and how to participate and look them up in the, on our community portal. What's the purpose of all this work, you may say? Uh, and I'm going to quote a wonderful Priscilla Talley. <laughs> Um, if you heard from Sela during the conversation, she has been heavily involved with CCL um, and is now uh, doing development work as well as doing diversity work. So she says this, as not what the community can do for you, learn what you can do for the community. So a lot of our work in diversity is that. What can we bring as CCLers to the community around them? What do we offer? We offer education, we offer professional development, team building, uh, community organizing. And we can do this with compassion in order to attract more people to come and be with us. I'm going to switch a little and talk a bit more about racism that Clara has started. Um, and I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you. I think this presentation has been changed at least four times since we started <laughs> because we wanted to make sure that we deliver the message that, that felt was right in our hearts. So Scott Woods is a writer and a poet. And this message that you see right there is a portion of what I'm about to read. He wrote this in 2014. And interesting enough, he wrote an article earlier in this month where he was explaining why people keep on using his message. And he says, I'm here to point out that the reason why it keeps coming back every couple of years is because we as a society aren't fixing the problem. And this is what he said. The problem is that white people see racism as conscious hate, when racism is bigger than that. Racism is a complex system of social political levers and pulleys set up generations ago to continue working on behalf of whites at other people's expense. Whether whites know it, like it or not, racism is an insidious cultural disease. 
It is so insidious that it doesn't care if you're a white person who likes black people. It's still going to find a way to infect how you deal with people who don't look like you. Yes, racism looks like hate, but hate is just one manifestation. Privilege is another, access is another, ignorance is another, apathy is another, and so on. So while I agree with people who say no one is born racist, it, seems, it remains a powerful system that we're immediately born into. It's like being born into air. You take it as soon as you breathe. It's not a cold that you can get over. There is no anti-racist certification class. It's, set, it's a set of socioeconomic traps and cultural values that are fired up every time we interact into the world. It is the thing you have to keep scooping out of the boat of your life to keep from drowning in it. I know it's hard work, but it's the price you pay for owing everything. So let's talk about anti-racism. You must have heard that word circling around. How to be an anti-racist is about the number one book right now on the New York Times bestsellers list. Um, and I'm glad that it is. Um, so Professor Ibram Kendi has been talking about what is a racist idea. And this is what he says. A racist idea is an idea that suggests one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. An anti-racist idea is any idea that suggests the racial groups are equal in all their apparent differences. You will explain a little more. One of the interesting things in the book is the idea that being a racist is not an identity. It is not a permanent condition of an individual. It's a temporary condition based on actions. Why define it in that way? Because I think with my earlier work chronicling the history of racist ideas, I, I found that you had some people who in the same speech, even in the same paragraph of the same speech, mm -hmm. would say things that were both racist and anti-racist. They would speak at the same to no time. at the same time, right? So, so then how would we identify that person as being a racist when they also said anti-racist things? They also spoke about racial equality. And so what's actually happening is I define racist and even anti-racist as based on what a person is saying or doing in the moment. And we constantly change. Yeah. Human beings are deeply complex. And, and I think that's a more accurate way to explain this. You call. So what am I asking you to do? I want you to be an active anti-racist. These are six ideas that were written by uh, reporter Rebecca Brees. And she took them out of the book and couldn't find a better way to explain it. Um, understand the definition of what is a racist. Stop saying I'm not racist. Um, Kendi says that people constantly change the definition of what a racist is, so it doesn't apply to them. Um, identify racial inequalities and disparities. Racism yields racial inequalities and disparities in every sector of private and public life. That includes politics, healthcare, criminal justice, education, income, employment, and home ownership. Being anti-racist means learning about and identifying inequities and disparities that give in particular white people or any racial group material advantage over people of color. Confront the racist idea you held or continue to hold. I cannot tell you how much that came through for me as a parent, um, having to learn and relearn the things that I have heard since I was a kid. One of them being, you have to marry a white person in order to better your family. I had a discussion with my daughter about this. The very interesting discussions I'm having with her now about everything that we're seeing. Understand how your anti-racism needs to be intersectional. Again, everything's connected. Think about how it's connected. And champion anti-racist ideas and policies. You cannot stop being a racist if you don't act. As a CCLer, you can also support the other Black, Indigenous, people of color, and CCLers inside the organization. Learn about the use of gender neutral and gender inclusive pronouns. We are gonna have a session about this. We can talk a little more about why that's being used. Provide feedback on what you're seeing in CCL. In my role, I spend a lot of time visiting the diversity group. And from time to time, I jump to others, like um, the, Lat if, well, yeah, is the Catholic Action Team. They actually went and created a Latino subgroup inside their action team because they were able to see the data and realize, hey, we can go and actually 
uh, learn about the Latino community a little bit more if we intersect more with Catholicism and religion. So it was fantastic to be able to see that growth. And I had spent a lot of time there because I want to see what people are doing and people are hearing and want to be able to help them in their work. Like everything else, I want you to continue learning. And again, stop thinking of diversity as a side thing. All right. So I'm going to give you a few examples of white people being allies to people of color just in the last couple of weeks. So one of our volunteers, Brian Edling, lives with his wife, Tanya, in Portland, Oregon. And when um, the uh, George Floyd murder happened, um, he encountered one of his African-American neighbors in the hallway of his apartment building. And he um, and her were on a first name basis and he asked her how she was doing. And she said that she was not okay. Um, the uh, events in the country were really weighing down on her and she didn't feel like any progress was being made. Um, you know, and it was just all so difficult for her, plus the pandemic and econo economy. Um, and Brian just very gently, honestly shared that he's lived in a bubble all of his life and has experienced a lot of white privilege um, and hasn't done a lot to help uh, fight racism. But he, he really wanted to do more um, and that he, he cared about her and um, uh, wanted to support her and would be happy to talk if she wanted to at any time. Um, and he uh, they had a short conversation that day and he left her a note saying how glad he was that, that they talked and, and to call him anytime. Um, and then a few days later, they had a three hour conversation uh, where they talked about race, religion, politics, all kinds of things. Um, and she was like, like I'm, I'm so glad that we have been able to talk um, with other people who live, me, live with me in this building, like, like they don't even look at me. They don't even know that I live here. Um, so that's, that's the power of that, that personal connection. Um, so you might think about who, who are the people of color in your life, you know, your neighbors, your colleagues, classmates, friends, um, and uh, reach out to them and care about them. Another example, um, these friends of mine um, who live in Detroit, they woke up in the middle of the night one night and uh, saw these bright lights outside of their window and they went out to investigate and they saw police officers arresting three young black men. Um, and they just went up and started filming the whole scene. And the police were telling them, go home, you know, this has nothing to do with you. Um, but they just stood there and continued to film the whole interaction. And the police were, were um, wanting to uh, impound the, uh, the people's car because um, they were saying that they, they couldn't drive it and um, uh, they were going to take away their car. So my friend actually offered to drive the three men home um, uh, so their car wouldn't get impounded. Uh, and um, you know, the, in the end, the police ended up going away. She drove them home and everybody was fine. So you know, that's probably not a thing that you encounter a lot of, but there's so many times when um, you know, something inappropriate is being said or you see something that's, that's a racist interaction happen. And um, you might just, say something or do something to intervene at that point and be like, excuse me, but what you just said, that was a microaggression or, um, uh, you know, like what, can I help you or what is happening here to try to um, diffuse the situation? We're also hearing stories in the news of um, white protesters standing in front of the police um, between uh, black protesters um, to help de-escalate the situation and um, prevent violence. So that's a way where they're, they're using their white privilege in a um, protest. Um, you might also think about how you can advance education and dialogue with others in, in other groups that you are part of. You know, so we're doing these, these talks at CCL and hosting all kinds of ways to learn. But what are the organizations other organizations that you are part of. So I'm um, a member of the Association of Environmental Science and Studies, and I'm a PhD student at Antioch University. So this spring, um, I worked with them to host the Diversity in Environment webinar series. And we invited 
four experts to come talk to us about racism uh, and sexism in uh, the environmental field um, and to, to try to advance our uh, thinking and actions in, in our own field. We can also support local and POC businesses. Um, I really like the story from um, Mahogany Books, uh, which is a black owned bookstore in Washington, DC. And they've just been selling a ton of books uh, on racism, including how to be an anti-racist. Um, so, you know, I, I find these kinds of things really encouraging where we're coming together to uh, be anti-racist. All right, and back to you, Karina. Thanks, Clara. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about how to continue to have this discussion is what we can do um, as people who hold certain positions, right? We are all um, members who volunteer for a group that is supporting climate solution in this manner. There is no other group like us out there. We believe in the bipartisan component and we believe in everything that we want to do. I constantly think of Marshall and everything that he ingrained inside this organization. At the same time, I feel that we can't separate ourselves from other issues. Um, Leah Thomas has been in discussions. You should Google her and I definitely suggest you follow her Instagram account. Um, she is talking about the participation of more environmentalists and social issues and one of them that she started with was environmentalists for Black Lives Matter. It's a fantastic discussion that she's having online. Um, and Alexander Villasenor, uh, um, believe it or not, another young activist. These are young activists that are asking us as adults um, to stop separating the issues and to work together to try to solve them. With COVID, the state of the country, the deaths of our Black brothers and sisters, it is difficult to ignore the reality of what is happening. Uh, this affects us and the way we do our work. And I want to end with this. Um, Tiffany English is the director of the Civil Rights Memorial Center. She wrote a piece entitled, It's Time to Demand Justice for Black People in America. And she says this, every injustice that has ever happened to us, specifically in the South, has happened on the local level. We can change that. And here are five places to start. Fully engage with each other in safe spaces. Advocate for those who do not have a voice. Leverage our power and our resources. Uplift the legacies of our people who fought and died for civil rights and lean on what they taught us. Exercise our right to vote. It is through our work in creating possibilities for today and for future generations that we best honor the accomplishments and legacy of our ancestors. You and I have the power to change this country. It's not going to be someone else. It will be us. Now more than ever, we must educate, equip, mobilize, and act. All right, thank you so much, Karina. So now I'm going to go rather quickly through some resources that we have collected. So um, you'll have access to the slides after this presentation. Um, and also we have like a, a Google Doc um, with some of these listed as well. So you can come back and look at these things. Um, so there's the database of fabulous leaders, people of color in environmental and climate justice. So if you're planning a conference or want someone who is an environmental justice leader to come speak to your group, um, you can find in this database um, a lot of interesting people. Uh, I also compiled a list of high profile people um, that we were considering for um, a keynote speaker. Uh, there's um, many websites and organizations devoted to this work. Um, this is my website actually where I posted the resources that I've, I've written on diversity. Um, Green 2.0 is um, great and they're, they're dedicated to um, improving diversity in environmental organizations and some other of these groups. Um, these are the three reports that I wrote which you can find in my website focusing specifically on Diversity City in the U.S. Climate Movement, um, four interviews with experts, our CCL survey, um, the reports from Green 2.0. Um, so uh, other kinds of resources like films, um, podcasts on racism, um, Black experience, organizations, uh, groups to donate to, 
uh, things you can do about, you know, this issue that we're having now, uh, books to read, more books to read, same books to read. Um, I really like these three on um, uh, diversity. And then these are really great. Um, let's see, Dorsa Taylor on the conservation movement and the history of racism there, better allies, success through diversity, um, articles. You can um, continue this discussion on CCL's forum, uh, community.citizensclimate.org slash forums. And you can email us at diversity at citizensclimatelobby.org. We also have um, Twitter. And then here is our contact. So in addition to the two of us, um, Princella Talley is our diversity coordinator and head of the climate and culture action team. And Jim Tolbert is our conservative outreach director. So after the information that you see, and we know it's a lot, um, I want you to think about what concept in this presentation impacted you the most. Um, I want you to think about one thing that you want to try in your chapter. And I definitely want to know about the first thing that you will try tomorrow, <laughs> because this is an everyday time to work. This work shouldn't be just doing your CCL hours. I want to envision us as CCLers being out in our communities, um, visiting different groups, in addition to having conversations with our friends. Um, I know it's going to get a little bit uncomfortable, and that's okay. I know that there's going to be mistakes made, and that's okay too. I don't see myself as the owner of all the right, quote, information activities. And that is why I welcome you and invite you for us to do this together. Um, it doesn't mean that our main focus is changing. It's just that we are learning more about what we can do for those around us and how we can help each other and make a better society because we all believe in that livable world we want to create. So we have like 20 minutes remaining for questions and for you to share your thoughts with us in the chat. Um, and again, we're just so glad to have you join us. You know, the fact that you picked this presentation just really shows that you care and um, you know, you're going to make a huge difference. Um, and this is hard work. You know, we're not all gonna be perfect anti-racists after an hour and a half, but um, I hope that we, we give you um, some ideas and know that we're, we're in this together with you. Um, and uh, if we keep doing the work, then we will have a deep transformation in ourselves and in society. Okay, I think we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, someone said, my big question is how do we integrate our chapters and help people of color feel comfortable in our groups? Oh boy, I've been answering that question for a year and a half. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tip one. <laughs> um, we need to stop going to our usual places where we go and recruit. Um, I can tell you what I've done. Okay, and this is only from my experience. I'm sure when you speak to other CCLs of color, they will give you other things, but this is what I've done. Um, I might also add that my chapter is still working to this because we don't have a lot of people of color right now. So I'm also working to it myself. But I personally have gone to festivals like Hispanic Heritage Month events, Cinco de Mayo events. I've gone to local high schools. I've gone to just things that are not considered traditional outreach events. Like tabling is my thing. It's the one thing that I brought to my chapter just because I like to socialize and I'm like, oh, I can tell people about this and I can do it in both English and Spanish. So why not use uh, the things that I have? Uh, the other things that I've done, I've gone to meetings for the NAACP because I am still building relationships with members of that organization. Um, at the time that I went, I was the only person, the only Latina inside the NAACP meeting at that time. And they were very welcoming. They asked me to come back again because of work. I haven't gone back, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to stop. Um, if you come across someone who may be uneasy about 
volunteering with us. You're gonna find that too. Um, a lot of the things that I have seen, uh, especially when I joined, um, CCO was given a really bad rap <laughs> when I joined in 2017. I came across someone at a community event and they were like, what in the world are you doing with CCL? They're just like, they're just not good people for us. And I had, a, you know, I responded with, I love their concept. I love their values. I believe in bipartisanship. And if they didn't have people of color prior to me, I am interested in them having more. So I'm gonna work towards doing that. And at that point I was still a volunteer. And in no way, shape, or form did I see myself having the role that I have because all I wanted was just to bring more Latinos to this party, okay? That was it. That's all I wanted to do. Um, and I figured the best way to do that is to go to the, to the places where I go and I have conversations with people uh, about what I do. So I am right now a member of a group here in my town called United Latina. And when I say this kind of work demands for you to build a long-term relationship, it does. It took me a year to be able to have a conversation with my fellow members of that group because it happens like this, like you determine a friendship, right? Um, I continue going to the meeting, I introduce myself, we would all say what we do, and I didn't really quite elaborate much on, we have a bill that is wants to tackle climate solutions in this way on a federal level. I would basically say, you know what, I'm an environmentalist and, and that's what I do. And then one day last year, after a year of seeing, seeing them, they were like, what exactly is it that you do? And, and how can I help you? And that conversation was like, oh, finally, it took a year, but they finally said it. Um, and I said, you know, I do this. And they gave me 15 minutes during one of their meetings to explain. And I had people sign constituent letters. And then after that, every single month, they were like, so how are we doing? Did we get any new sponsors? Like, how is Florida doing? You know, the conversation has to take place so organically. Um, it has to feel natural. It doesn't have to feel like it's being forced. Um, a lot of, usually the impression is like, you know, the white people need us and now they're coming to us because they need us. And I don't want people to feel that way. They've always felt that way. Um, it explains why you don't see a lot of participation from people of color and we constantly feel included. Um, so, but yeah, so I can offer that for right now. <laughs> I can say a little more about that. Um, like to, so I, I work mostly with young people and like recruiting youth to CCL. Um, uh, I, I feel like they're pretty open, you know, it's not as resistant as maybe some of the people that Karina work with. And for me, the strategy is really just to cast a wide net because they are out there and they want to join. Um, and, you know, I recently, um, uh, just wrapped up enrolling people for the um, summer climate advocate training program and 45% of the people who joined mostly of them college students were people of color uh, and you know we made it a totally free um, no application process um, totally online and and we we advertised in LinkedIn and handshake and um, you know, directly to school departments, just going outside of like your normal environmental clubs or um, groups. Um, just in higher education, students of color are like 50% of the college population. Um, so, so if you're making it very open and transparent, they, they are there. Before we continue, there's a question. I, I'm sorry that I can't answer a lot of them privately. Uh, but again, if you email me, I will make sure to, to answer those questions for you. But one that's sticking out to me is, how do I speak with right-wing racist folks about diversity? Um, oh, that's a tough one. I can tell you this. I haven't encountered the racist part of the conservative person, but I have encountered a conservative person, and I've encountered a conservative Latino. And that discussion took an hour. I was at a tabling event, it was a Latino festival, and a man came over and he looked at everything and he's like, what is this? So I explained. And you know what got us to a good conversation? The fact that I made point to our values. And he was like, I don't understand how you do this, I don't, how you do this work. And, and it took an hour, but you know what? 
it was such a good conversation. It's probably one of the best conversations I've had since I've been a CCLer because after he was done, you know what he did? He took the constituent form and he started writing and signing it. And he's like, Karina, I don't know if this idea is going to work, but if you're there and advocating on our behalf, I'm going to support you. And that's what I loved about it. You know, it doesn't have to require um, us to constantly be thinking or being afraid of what the other people are going to say. There's going to be certain people that are going to listen to the message. And in my time with CCL, I've encountered three. Uh, the person that comes in, look at our work, and says, uh, this is a great idea, but you move too slow for what I want to do as part of climate solution. Uh, number two, you come in, you interact, you sort of do a little bit of work, and then you're like, okay, yeah, maybe I can continue, but you know what, I have time and responsibilities and I can't do it all the way. Or the person that comes in, look at our work, and starts analyzing absolutely everything that we do, and they're like, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but this is not for me. And we also have to start thinking about that. There's the possibilities when we invite people to the space, and it's just not gonna be for them, and we have to be okay with that. Um, is 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 work that we I am personally still trying to see what things are going to work. I don't have right now the right solution, but I don't think every single person of color that is with us, um, and we all struggle with this because um, we have conversations inside the PGM caucus when we get together. Um, it is really challenging and is very is work for a specific type of people. Just like we have experts inside CCL, different types of volunteers who uh, are people that are good at letter writing and people do are, are good at doing presentations. We're gonna have certain people that want to do the diversity outreach um, and everybody has a different way of doing them. Um, but you know, what is it that we want to ultimately accomplish? I want you to think about that, right? We want as many people as possible to be part of the conversation. Why? Because when we walk into those offices in DC, the representation really matters. I had been in meetings where there had been more people of color and the conversation is completely different and it's so impactful. And that's why we need to do this work and to be more active in doing this work. Um, we have another question about inviting people into CCL. Um, someone asked, among CCL volunteers, I frequently hear, if we just talk to people of color and environmental justice groups, they will love carbon fee and dividend in HR 763. How should we respond to this? That's a tough one. <laughs> it, HR 763 has different, um, it depends who you're talking to, right? So I'm not the policy person. I am not the person in DC having the discussions with people who look at our bill and have a lot of questions and concerns about whether it reaches, um, it provides a dividend and it actually reaches all people of color or whether that dividend is equitable, right? Um, these are still discussions that we still need to have. And I hold on, my optimistic self, hold on to the idea that the bill still needs to be discussed in the halls of Congress, um, that it still needs to be amended, because I doubt that there is a representative in a primarily high Latino, African-American um, sectors of this country who wouldn't be concerned and will ask that question. So my role is to continue to have that discussion. And it's, it's so incredibly hard because there's a lot of, um, there's maybe perceived notions I, I want to think about the work that we do and, you know, and everybody's perception is valid. I mean, if you've been in situations where everything you ever see is a power plant being built in a Latino neighborhood or a Black neighborhood, you're going to have that distrust always. So how can I trust you? as a member of CCO, come and tell me about this bill that we're supporting and expect to think that it will be good for my community, right? 
So that's why we have to continue. Sorry, Clara. That's why we have to continue to, um, to get out there and have discussion with people and, and have them get to know us as people and not just as as CCLs. Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, you know, we as CCL talk a lot about um, talking to people from addressing their concerns. So, so you know, whether they are conservative or farmers or uh, you know, live in the inner city, but like like first hearing, why do you care about climate change? How does it affect you? And then um, you know, how our work, our solution. Uh, can help them with that. And, and kind of using that Catherine Hayhoe method, uh, we can bring anyone into this issue, but everyone has a stake in climate change. Uh, we don't all have to start with um, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you know, or HR 7063, but just who, who are you on earth and uh, how, how is climate change impacting your life? Yeah, and, and we're also getting a lot of questions about responding to microaggressions and racist behavior specifically within CCL activities. So one person asked, um, any suggestions for calling out racist behavior or statements at our CCL chapter meetings, both in a one-on-one -on -one context and others in a full group? And we have someone asking, um, what is the best way to respond as a white person to microaggressions from another white volunteer? I'll try to address that. Um, I think first we, we need to recognize that microaggressions are, are so subtle and you may be doing it and not even know it. So um, I think taking cues from people of color, like if they, they are quiet and they don't like engage you after you said something to them, uh, you know, maybe like, like think about why that was. Um, and it takes courage to go back and say, you know, hey, that was maybe a little bit, um, wrong, but I didn't intend for it to be racist. Um, or if you hear someone else say something like that, to, to have a conversation about them. Um, and the important thing to do there is recognize that microaggressions are unintentional and unconscious. Um, you know, it's best not to call them a racist, um, but just be like, hey, you know, like this, this is um, something to be aware of. And the other person's um, perception of what you said is different than, than what you intended. So to give you a few examples of, of things that I experience. Um, so uh, I don't know if you guys know um, uh, Debbie Chang in the DC chapter, but she, people mistake us for each other a lot. And Debbie constantly gets comments like, oh, you're Clara. And she's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and you know, we've been a CCL both for like five years. Um, and um, they don't get us straight. So it's, that's like, um, pretty subtle, but like, like you know, think about like whether, how often that would happen with a white person um, and try to remember people's names. Um, or like someone might say to me, um, uh, oh, you know, I, my, my niece uh, um, has a, a, a Chinese partner and they just love that country so much. And <laughs> we're just so glad to have them in the family. And, you know, like they might say this, like as soon as they get to know me and I'm like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> um, and a lot of times they're just trying to be friendly, right? But it's like, it's a, a little, um, uh, how do I say it? Like, like thinking about people in terms of their racial and ethnic backgrounds before you've gotten to know them as a person. If you're in a five hour car ride and you know, later on in the conversation, you're talking about, oh, where you come from and I have family members who are Chinese, great. But it's, it's um, different if that's like the first thing that, that you say to them after you've met them. I can also add a bit to that. <laughs> it just reminded me of the many times I have been told <laughs> that Mexico is a great country, although I'm not from there. <laughs> um, and in, in, yeah, prior to me visiting Mexico, I think someone had said that while I was working. Um, and I <laughs> will definitely notice in, um, I've gotten anything from your English is extremely good uh, to like, um, you know, I know about Mexican food and things of the sort. And I have just stood there completely silent because I, at first I was like, do, how do I respond to that? Did I get angry and yell and tell them not to do that? Or do I just take it, do my work, and let it be? So I have developed over the years an amount sense of sarcasm 
just because that's the only way I can deal with the things I hear. So I would start saying things like, yeah, I hear Mexico is a great country. And, and, and I, when that happened to me the first time, I was like, and I, I haven't had an opportunity to visit them um, yet, but I hear they're wonderful. And then of course they get embarrassed and they're like, oh, you know, my apologies. And I'm like, and you know, and I would say, you know, yeah, that, that's usually the, the conversation. And I think at some point I may have had conversations with other people that um, later apologized for saying something like that. Um, and I would, um, I would make a suggestion that if you see a microaggression or are involved in a microaggression, that you go to the person that you said this to and, and, and have either a private conversation with them about this um, to apologize. Um, because I think we're going to take it from the end of maybe you didn't know when you were saying it. And there's possibly a, a way that you can have a more public, public discussion, but it also depends on the level of trust, right? I am used to not addressing a lot of these microaggressions, which is absolutely wrong, because culturally I am thought not to correct people. But I am not gonna do that anymore <laughs> because it's just not right. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you're a right? woman and you're supposed to be like friendly and polite all the time, right? Like not offend anybody. Yeah. So, you know, have the conversation and ask the person whether they want that to be addressed privately or have that addressed in a public sphere. Because um, it, it's going to depend a lot of the members of your chapter and the relationship you guys have. So you guys are the only uh, people in that circle that can determine whether something like that can be addressed in a public setting or in a private setting. Um, one thing I hear about a lot, and we've been talking about this in, in the um, volunteer coordinator circles, is, is people talking too much in lobby meetings um, or any meeting. So, so like, can you notice who are the ones who, who are speaking uh, at meetings? Who are the ones leading the meetings? Are you giving time to young people to speak or women? or people of color, um, you know, white men, older people are, are used to kind of just taking the lead on a lot of these things, but like maybe pull back more than um, you think is appropriate. Yeah, and we have a question that kind of builds on this conversation. Um, can you speak more about how privilege is a part of racism, yet it is also what needs to be leveraged to help people of color? How do we bring together those two concepts? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, so privilege denotes that there is an inequality, that some people have access to privilege and others don't. Um, and who are the ones who have access under what conditions they have access? Um, so, so when we talk about um, you know, diversity, it's not just about having people of color at meetings, but it's really about equity and inclusion, right? Like, do people feel like they are welcome here? Do they feel like they have a role? Do they feel like they can be leaders um, and use their talents to the max? Um, you know, that they, they aren't just uh, a body, <laughs> um, you know, and they're, that their ideas matter. Um, so it's, it's very important, I think, for us to um, keep focusing on like, uh, inclusion, this idea of, of belonging, like what makes your group a, a home and a place where, where people feel a part of a community? Okay, and I think we have time for just one more question. Um, people of color will be disproportion disproportionately impacted by climate change. If I talk to a person of color, how can I bring that up without painting them in a victim light? That's a good one. That requires a, that's a, that's a long extended yeah. answer. I, I think they know that. I mean, like people of color like have personal experience. Um, when I did the CCL survey a year ago, um, one of the questions was, um, uh, have you been, has climate change personally impacted you? Um, and, and like 90% of the people of color said yes. And maybe about 40% of white people said yes. Um, and then 
the other question was, do you think climate change will impact you in the future? And pretty much everybody said yes. Um, so I don't think we need to point that out so much to them. Like they, they feel this. <laughs> yeah, the other thing is um, I, when I have discussions with people and I think we're at 2.30, so my apologies if this is an extremely short answer. Um, I, I would normally, uh, I end up having a conversation and I say, I would love to hear what kind of ideas you have in order to address this concern. Because I think it's also very important to, to, to ask for their viewpoint, right? We cannot just go in there and basically say, hey, can you like support this idea that we have or this bill that we're supporting in order to address? I'm sure a lot of people of color, indigenous and black, have a lot of suggestions of things that they would like to see. So I think that would give you an opportunity to have a very good discussion. Yeah, and, and like, you know, instead of being a victim, um, having experienced impacts of climate change is a source of power. You know, you have the story to tell of like why climate change should be addressed, why it matters to us, how it's affecting me personally. Um, and, and uh, you know, we have all these ways for people to take action and taking action is really um, what uh, gets people out of despair and, and into a more hopeful future. Well, shall yeah. we wrap up here? So I guess, Tony, you can take it away. Yeah, thank you, Clara and Karina so much. And thank you for everyone for attending. This has been great. Um, you know, this discussion obviously needs to continue and you can do that um, on CCL community. We'll be having more workshops like this and we hope that you'll share this with your uh, friends, with your chapters, with your family. And uh, thank you again so much for taking time out of your Sunday to join us here and thank you Clara, Karina, Susan, and Keston for all of your work. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for your questions, everyone. Thank you, guys.